Rotary International was founded in 1905. The goal of Rotary International is to seek peace through service to communities. Service above self has been the motto of Rotary International. Today, there are roughly 30,000 Rotary Clubs in over 160 countries around the world. 1.2 million men and women are members in clubs that are all part of this unique international service organization. All clubs worldwide participate in various programs to fill the needs of communities. Each Rotary Club identifies its community needs and links up with other Rotary Clubs to match funds that provide a school, a deep water well, a library, a hospital, or whatever is needed for that local community. Thousands of projects are completed each year thanks to the generosity of Rotarians and friends of Rotary. Whether in Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, or even North America, there are community needs that Rotarians help fulfill. Through this spirit of service above self, Rotarians build a fellowship that create friendships that last a lifetime. Men and women in Rotary provide the opportunity to reach out, help, and give hope to others. This service builds trust, and trust builds hope. Hope that through international service, we can build a better world and create understanding and peace. This is the goal of Rotary International. This program is a window for you to see the projects supported by the Rotarians in your own community. Hi, my name is Marty Peters and I am the host of a program called Rotary in Action. We have prepared seven 30-minute videos these videos cover everything from Rotary Volunteers to Youth Exchange, RILA, Polio Plus, Group Study Exchange, and a wide variety of presentations that you can use in your own communities. Each 30-minute show comes complete, and all you need to do is to give it to your local TV channel, your local cable TV channel, and they will air it for you. No cost. Uh, the production has already been done by and donated by the Del Mar Rotary Club, here in Southern California, District 5340. It's our hope that you'll see these highlights in these next 10 minutes. And if you like them and you want to get the seven videotapes, you can take them to your own TV channels in your own community. And we are hoping that you can have those on your own local air for your own public relations. And most importantly, when people are motivated, they will call your Rotary Club to become Rotarians and get involved. We do this in the hopes that PR, public relations for Rotary is enhanced in your own community. Also, the second aspect is we would hope that those men and women that watch this in your cable area will become passionate and want to join Rotary. You dress up the Rotarians that are there yes, to help? Yes, we embarrass them as much as possible. This is the <laughs> funnest part here. And we're telling a story while they're prancing around on stage, and it's definitely a handful of laughs there. Ryla may be about serious topics, but we also have a lot of fun. Yeah, Carrie? fun. Yeah. Oh. This Watch is this the here. last day when we're about ready to leave and head back onto the buses. And it's just a time to, to reflect about what's happened the last couple days and just to solidify the friendships that mm. we've made and then head on home, down the mountain. A lot of tears. 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 Yeah. Well, it's interesting to see this because we've been there sometimes and I really, it's very emotional at this time, you know that. For everybody. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. You know, it's uh, one of the questions I was going to ask is you were asked to become an alumni and go back. Tell us a little bit how that process works. How do they pick? Uh, how many people of the original group that go up are invited to come back? Well, as a junior, while you're at camp, your facilitator and the small groups, uh, they nominate certain people to come back, those who are interested. So there were about 240 the year I went, and about 80 were selected for nomination purposes, and mm. then about 10 were actually selected back. So it's about 5%. 
that actually are able to return. It's pretty prestigious. What a, what a flattering bit. Yeah, you know, the, the message that I would infer in that too is that you're learning to give back and this is the best way to attribute that. Daryl, how do you pick the 10? I mean, that must be the toughest job. It is a tough job and we're talking about the best of the best. But we actually have them run the conference and so they really have to have a chance to d show what they've learned and developed through Ryla and their own experiences. Well, this is the uh, map of the world in 1988, which includes in red the countries where polio was still endemic. Uh, you can see that most of North America uh, was free in Australia. And there were 350,000 cases, over 350,000 cases in 88. By 1999, Rotary and the World Health Organization and the CDC had dropped that to uh, 7,000 cases. It remains only in Africa, the Indian subcontinent. In India, this is a map of India, in 1998, there were over, over almost 2,000 cases of polio that year. By 1999, we had, by using massive national immunization days in which uh, polio vi vaccine was administered to every child in the country, uh, we had reduced it to almost a little over 1,000 and by last year to 150 cases. Uh, this is the current status. It still exists in, in, in the Indian subcontinent and parts of Africa, and we're making a, a major effort to, to wipe it out. Uh, this kind of shows you that initial fundraising drive raised a lot of money, which we invested. By the year 2005, we would have paid over $500 million to help eradicate polio. It's absolutely astounding. Uh, I, I always am reminded of that goal that we had in our local district that we raised that money. And Steve, tell us about how uh, after we'd picked, uh, we'd raised these funds, how did we pick this little country that uh, we decided to go to? Well, you're referring to Eritrea, and that's, uh, Nick mentioned that we raised enough money to uh, uh, help with the national immunization days for the, an mm -hmm. entire country with $137,000. We picked Eritrea, um, which is a country many people are not familiar with, because there's a special relationship that's evolved between that country and the Rotarians uh, in our district. It goes back, uh, starting in about 1990, um, some of us learned that there's a significant Eritrean community in San Diego. Um, uh, the, the Eritreans, some of them are banquet managers mm -hmm. of the hotels where our Rotary Clubs meet, and we learned about their, their country through them, and we learned that um, actually then they didn't have Rotary in, in their country. But then a couple of other things happened. Uh, in the mid-1990s, uh, we did a program with the Eastern, Eastern Africa, with uh, that region of the world, and we found that a lot of the Rotarians in that part of the world had friends in Eritrea, although Rotary didn't exist there, and our African friends thought it would be good if we could have uh, a Rotary Club in Eritrea. Come to find out, San Diego's Eritrean community is well organized. Mm -hmm and we met with the leadership group from the San Diego Eritrean community, explained to them what Rotary is, and they thought that their, their country was ready for Rotary. So the local Eritrean community, together with the Rotarians in Africa, established a number of contacts there. We set up an organizational meeting back in 1996, mm -hmm. and uh, a core group of people uh, uh, formed and said yes, they, they wanted to be part of Rotary, they wanted to be part of this organization, and ultimately um, a club was chartered in Asmara, uh, Eritrea in 1997. And because of our district relationship with the establishment of that club and the contacts that we have um, uh, over there, mm -hmm. it just seemed like a natural place. We had enough money to immunize the whole country, and so that's where we decided to go. Jack, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how this, how this happened in your own club, and what would you like to add as far as the uh, your own involvement on that fundraising side? Well, when I first, uh, uh, as I said at the last second, as I uh, challenged the club to uh, make contributions to polio that I would match, I was not in Rotary. It came about later that, uh, that they decided that yes, they wanted to do that. And so we had a fairly large fundraising organization there. Nick uh, was uh, leading it on the club side and I was just an outsider who was trying to encourage them to help get rid of polio for me because I've got a 
personal agenda of getting rid of polio before it gets rid of me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. With us this evening, we have two special guests. Our first guest is Laura Basanich, who is a, an ambassadorial scholar that actually was in Australia some years ago uh, in Sydney and spent a whole year over there uh, and is back to share some time with us this evening. Our second special guest is Wayne Cusick, who Wayne is a former district governor uh, who has been the foundation chair in our region, our district, and most importantly has been very responsible in the coordination of all of the programs that are entailed in making these successful ambassadorial programs really work. Uh, first of all, Laura, I'd like to ask you, uh, how did you find out about this neat program called Ambassador of Scholars? Right. I, uh, my last year of college, actually, I worked for the library that helped inform students about going abroad. And it was publicized. You had sent us a lot of literature on it. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend who had applied, and I found out a little bit more about it that way. And so I thought, wow, I knew I'd wanted to advance my education and I wanted to do it in another country. And the scholar program, the ambassadorial scholar program was really perfect because it allowed that and that's what exactly what it was. So it was really exciting. I thought, yeah. I'd like to, uh, this time, uh, ask you, Wayne, tell me about this process for these career paths. Do we, do we ever have any plan on where they're gonna wind up or is it just sort of like, let them go? Well, Marty, it's, we're really proud of the fact that in Rotary International, we have roughly 1,300 yeah. ambassadorial scholars going abroad each year. Now, that could be Jap Jap Japanese scholars coming to the United States or, or to uh, Argentina, or scholars being selected here, going to uh, uh, Ecuador, um, mm -hmm. uh, Kenya, what have you. Uh, but we, we devote a lot of time, energy, and effort in this uh, roughly $12 million a year investment in, in our youth. And we hope that someday the return on that investment will be the participation and involvement such as Laura. It's an amazing investment, but I think the returns are just outstanding. They just are immeasurable. Yes. Phil, let me ask the question to you of this Mohammed uh, Yedis, how did, how did this doctor get this great dream? How did this all happen? He was, he was teaching economics at the University of Bangladesh in Chittagong in Bangladesh. And um, he was teaching macroeconomics, which said that if, if you poured millions of dollars into a country to build up the superstructure, the infrastructure, as they were doing at the mm -hmm. time, that it would trickle down to the poor people. And it wasn't. People were dropping dead in the streets. The worst famine in the history of the area. And he couldn't understand why. By all he taught, it couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. So he went out into the villages and interviewed the women and the people in the villages trying to find out what really was wrong, what was happening. And he found that that who was making bamboo stools and, and she made the most beautiful stools you've ever seen. Wonderful. And she worked 12 or, eight, 12 or 13 hours a day. And, mm -hmm. and he asked her how much she made. She said, two pennies, two pennies a day. And she explained that the reason was that she couldn't, she didn't have the money to buy the raw materials herself. So she had to borrow from the trader. So then the trader bought back the finished product at just barely more than the cost of the materials. So that's what gave Giannis the idea that credit was a solution to their problem. Timmy, how did you get involved in this? Is this the same uh, involvement? Um, I was involved in a leadership uh, class that was four months long, just through another group. And we were responsible for setting up a project, and then they were mentoring us on how to go about creating it to be a big possibility. And um, they gave us some examples. One of the examples was uh, one of our fellow Rotarians working on these uh, village banks. And my, I, I just, that was it. 
I had to be involved. Yeah. Where did you go the very first trip you ever took? Uh, down to Chiapas, which is near Guatemala. Guatemala. It's in Mexico. Uh, very colorful area, picturesque. Um, it was an incredible experience. Um, in fact, you know, I hope you'll we'll talk about this because the the involvement of the children, uh, the language issues, some of the cultural issues, it's it's really incredible. And all of these things have happened all over the world, from Bangladesh now to Central and Latin America. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All over the, the world. Philippines. I went with a group of five teachers. We represented uh, the variety of education in our area from suburban elementary schools. And, but when we went to Mombasa, we were hosted by Dr. Verinda Sir, who was a Rotarian, but who also took us to a school where they planted five trees, one for each member of our, of our team. It was very special to know that we were part of that. When we visited the French-speaking island of Mauritius, we visited the Institute of Education where teachers were just beginning to be trained there. However, when we went to Uganda, the impact of the civil unrest nearly overwhelmed us. However, the warmth of our hostess just over overshadowed that. They did all that they could to tell us about their community, to welcome us into their homes. My joy, of course, of course came when I met the students at the schools. Um, they were excited to see us, but also excited to tell us about themselves. And then visiting the various um, clubs while we were there, we had an opportunity to talk about who we are, but mainly we had a chance to listen. We had an opportunity on one evening to share the birthday party of a young man who, 50 years old there, is considered old. And oh, then thanks a lot. <laughs> finally, <laughs> um, seeing drums being made from Mvuli wood and visiting the tombs of the kings uh, made it a very emotional experience for me because I wondered perhaps this was the home of my ancestors as well. And uh, being able to share this experience and to hear the people who said, you must be from our country, you look like us. And then they would give me tribal names and sing and clap and just made me feel very much at home. So when I returned to the United States, uh, joyfully sharing the experience, wearing the clothing that uh, my host family had made for me and sharing the flags of the various countries and the banners from the various clubs with where, where we spoke made it a round experience for me. What a powerful time that you could bring all that information back and share that also with your students in the classes. That must be exciting. was able to share it with classes, but also with churches in our community. We talked to various groups, and then when they heard about our, the, our experience, we were able to send a half a ton of books with the cooperation of students from our school as well as members of the youth groups and the churches in the area. And many of the young people agreed to become pen pals. And so the relationships have gone on. And grown and grown. It's and grown. the rippling effect, as we said earlier. Very much so. Sandy, you know, all these people that are picked by group study exchange, they're not, they're not Rotarians. They're, these are uh, people in the community that have this great opportunity. What's the magic? How does that, how does that extrapolate in, in the rippling effect, I guess, of the community? How does this help the community get better and grow bigger? Well, from my perspective, one of the things that happens is more and more people actually learn about Rotary and what we do, and that's, you know, that's my bias. But I think more importantly, each of these people go out and they touch so many lives, especially when they're teachers. Yeah. They touch so many lives, and they're able to tell the story of Rotary, but they're also able to tell about their experiences and, and, and how it impacted them and how they saw that they were impacting those that they, that they met. And so it, um, I learned a great deal about the, the field of education as well. <laughs> so it was a good experience for all, I think. What is this youth exchange? How did it start? And what's happened in this last five or 10 or 15 years? 
Well, Youth Exchange started um, initially in Denmark before the Second World War and obviously stopped during the war, but it, immediately after the war they picked it up again and started um, exchanging. They did it just in Europe to start with um, and it caught on over in our country back in, 1960, in the 60s. Um, California became an, uh, one of the first mm -hmm. ones to do that. Then uh, in, the, in the early 70s, uh, Rotary said this looks like a very good idea. I think we'll uh, encourage this and sort of sponsor this. And from that time on, it's been expanding and expanding. It started initially with a full year exchange, and then they've added a youth exchange for summertime, anywhere from four to six weeks. And they've added uh, even a shorter exchange called summer camp. And, uh, and now they're expanding even beyond this now. They've, they've handled the 15 to 19 year olds and they're going from 19 to 24 year olds to, to cover the ones they've missed before. So. Would you tell us a little bit, Alex, about how did you find out about this silly thing called youth exchange with Rotary? Well, um, my junior year of high school, I went to Ryla and um, Bill Sturgeon was there <laughs> and I got to talking to him and um, a lot of the other people in my group at Ryla were all excited about youth exchanges and I'd been wanting to travel but I didn't have, I just didn't want to go away for a whole year mm -hmm. and so then I, when I found out about these summer camps that were just for a few weeks and it's all sponsored by Rotary, I got right on it and applied and went. Uh, when you when you got a, when you applied, was it part of your school or just through Ryla you found out of it? And then how did you go about applying um, after that? Just through Ryla, I think you gave me your card, Bill, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I came back and I called, and um, so it wasn't really through school. It was just me just, finding just what I could do, <laughs> going and doing it, yeah. just to speak. And how did you find out about it, Stephanie? Similar, similar? Or? Um, no, actually, um, my sophomore year of high school. Um, I was friends with the, she was a senior, she was the president of our high school's Interact Club mm -hmm. and I, I was a second year French student and she was telling me how about this trip to France that she had gone on with Rotary and I was like, what is this? And she gave me Bill Sturgeon's phone number <laughs> and I gave him a call and I went on my trip and now I'm an active member of the Interact Club in addition to it. And that was about it. So here you are, back from a, a time in France, helping your language skills. Uh -huh. Still in high school and uh, getting involved now in the youth organization here at your own local high school. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how this all sort of comes full circle. You know, when we when we think about the opportunities that Rotary has availed, you know, there's a million, what, 200,000 men and women around the world, and all these connections that they have in these various Rotary clubs. Now there are more than 29,800 Rotary clubs, and all of these clubs are interconnected, and helping people achieve these amazing dreams. You know, I would like to uh, share this thing on the problem that I've seen, and I've, I've talked to you about this before, Rosa, was the differences in schools that go on. Uh, we have a, a film clip that I'd like to sort of have us take a look at and just talk about it as it's going on with the facilities or the lack of the lack of facilities lack. that they have over there. You know, it's Rosa talking about this, the kids that you've seen in these schools. Uh, tell us a little about what goes on in these classrooms yeah. and what's missing. Uh, what's what's lacking? I guess is a better word. Well, what is lacking is uh, resources. Basically, yeah. when you have huge class, uh, huge class sizes, you, you know, here we have caps. We're used to our cap sizes. You know, the typical, uh, you know, classroom in America. Over there, there is no such thing as a cap. Uh, we have you know, 40, 50, 60 students at a class, and some of them might not even have a chair to sit. You know, they will be on the floor. Not only that, but blackboard. What is a blackboard? A yeah. blackboard is. Uh, piece of you know cement on the wall painted black and that's what yeah. you use so the chalk that you use it's no good yeah. erasers what's an eraser there is no such thing right. you know you we get little rags over there or something like that books um, there is no such thing as books and one of the nice things about you know when Patrick and I traveled together to uh, the our first year we realized what was needed and right. uh, we came back and immediately we started working on that try to get our resources together so that whoever took our spot Place later on uh, was able to 
you know, to have something to, have to, something work, to work with. with. Yeah, to work with. I'm, I'm looking at these shots and I'm just amazed at the, the, the density, the compressed nature. Patrick, mm -hmm. is this normal for these kinds of classrooms? Yeah, it's totally normal. And a scene before, they showed children, four children sharing a book. That's just standard in Africa. So the classrooms are packed, but the one thing, the children are very well behaved and fighting f to learn. Fighting. This, is a, this is a good example of what a school would look like. There's no roofs. The chalkboard is a little easel, if that. Doors, no doors, mud. You know, that's it. Yeah. But the, the amazing thing is that they're striving to learn in this environment. Mm -hmm. They know the mm -hmm. importance of knowledge. It's astounding. I, I'm just, I was amazed at looking at some of these photos that were brought back, that you brought back when you were there the last time. And it's just, it's astounding to see how far they go with such little, little. and how much further that we can take them if we can bring more uh, in Rotary volunteers, more passion to be in the countries. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I don't know, they, they talked about water over there too. Is that a problem as far as the... Well, and you know, that's something as, as simple as a glass of water we take for granted. If we go to a drinking fountain, we <laughs> grab a glass of water at our home in mm -hmm. the sink, we turn the... You know, there, there is no such thing. There is no luxury of, as, you know, to turn the water on. Um, so that is something that we just, <laughs> like I said, we just take for granted. I love this with these, these students that never seen anybody blow bubbles. And now this was a red balloon that uh, some of the The small detail that yeah. makes them so happy. Makes that is, exciting. you know, that is one of the things that Patrick and I noticed. I wanted to ask you a question that I don't know how to phrase this, Patrick, but how could we make Rotary volunteers better? How can we share with more people this opportunity for them to get involved? I just think advertising the opportunities because everyone has inside of them something that wants to give something back. So it's for teachers advertised within the schools. If you need an engineer to go build a bridge or a well in a third world country, advertise in the engineering department. Just go to the places where you need those types of workers. And people will volunteer. This is a life long opportunity to give something back to less fortunate.